I get to speak uh, five minutes more than what's allotted. So I'm going to use that for our uh, interaction. Uh, I'm Sangeeta Jairam. I'm from uh, TCA, Tata Consultancy Services. Um, I'm part of uh, the Visualization Center of Excellence. I head the Visualization Center of Excellence. Uh, we've been here the last two days. This is my first uh, experience here in UX uh, India. Um, I was a bit uh, surprised to see that uh, not many visualization topics have been uh, spoken about when uh, that's one of the latest, uh, one of the latest trending aspects of uh, both design as well as the uh, implementation uh, field. So uh, before we go ahead, I'd like to know how many of you have worked on uh, visualization uh, projects and how many of you uh, there's, there's a lot of disconnect between visual design and visualization. So I want to understand how many of you have worked so that I can I know where to begin. Can you guys raise hands? You've all been on visualization projects. Okay. And the rest of you, um, you've heard of what visualization is about. Okay, I, I see some nods and I see some no's. So I could be repetitive to uh, some people, but I'm going to try and keep it uh, as interactive as possible. Feel free to stop me now that I have some time. Uh, we could uh, address the questions right then and there. Okay. Uh, so uh, my presentation is going to be uh, revolving around uh, uh, what visualization is and assuming that we all know uh, the key design principles of uh, visualization. What are the small nitty-gritties that we need to keep in mind when we are designing? So that we are actually able to uh, address the actual needs of the users. Uh, how many of you have heard of uh, David McCandles? David McCandles? No. Okay. He is a writer, he's an author, he's a designer, he works uh, independently, he's worked for, uh, he's done a lot of visualization projects. Uh, he's very famous, you go to TED Talks, his talks are one of the most uh, viewed ones. Uh, he classifies visualization like this. So um, let me take a step back and say, uh, define what visualization is. So visualization is the art and science of creating or art and science of designing information and data that can be perceived by the human cognitive system. So you're basically using your design skills, you're using your uh, visual aesthetics, your appeal to ensure that whatever information you're presenting on the screen is easily understood and easily absorbed by the user. Now the context of where visualization can be used is everywhere. You have to understand the context and then you can apply those things. But largely if you look at uh, in areas such as uh, reporting, you look at uh, some, sometimes in dashboards, sometimes in geospatial views where you're trying to depict um, uh, underlying geography, metaphor and things like that, visualization comes into play. Why it comes into play? Because you, you're putting, it, putting in lots and lots of information and it's very tough for the user to actually digest those information. So you need to play around uh, the way in which the user is able to absorb. You work on his uh, cognitive abilities and you work on the colors, aesthetics, positions, so that he's able to derive information out of it and actually make some decisions. So the objective of visualization is always an actionable alert. So he's able to take some kind of action or he's able to take some kind of a decision and then go forward. Now quickly, uh, the definition of visualization, as I said, is the art and the science of representing data and information. There are four perspectives which form the four legs of visualization. So if you see information, you will work with information. Information is one of the legs of visualization. The second is story. Third is goal. Any visualization needs to have an objective. And the fourth is the visual form, the way in which you represent information. So whenever you start getting into a visualization project, somebody comes and tells you that uh, 
I want to have, uh, you know, I want to have this cool looking visual in my project or I want to have, the, first and foremost, you need to understand whether, does it re really require a visualization? Is, is it, is, is, it, does it justify? Or they're just looking for some kind of a branding or they're looking for some kind of an aesthetic improvement of what they have. So, for, so once you categorize and you say that, yes, I need this, this is a visualization problem and I think I need to get down to crack it. So you start working as a data scientist. So how many of you attended uh, Atul Manohar's session yesterday afternoon on big data? Right, so the, the concept, I'm just carrying it forward from there. So there it's more technical, you're working around data, you're working around uh, lots of different information that's available. So here we were, we're looking at it from a designer's perspective. So when you start, you should look at whether you have complete information that is data about the visualization that you're looking at. What is the story? So you will have lots and lots of data. You'll have uh, data around, uh, uh, you know, let's say, just for instance, you're looking at uh, a company's performance. You'll have data around the performance. You'll have data around the people who are using that product. You'll have data around how they are interacting with various uh, forms of, let's say, campaigns that the companies uh, are actually conducting to uh, accept their products and things like this. This information, this so much information overload. So you will have all that information. What you need is a story or a concept. You need to understand who is your audience, how are they going to consume your visualization, and then you define the story. We'll see how. I'm not getting into the design principles. I'm just, I'm not getting it. Thanks. I'm not getting into the design principles, but I'm just going to just touch upon a bit uh, uh, on the design principles. And then we look at the goal or the objective. So the objective is something that you will need to have it from the beginning. Never waver from the visualization's objective because your primary insights are going to be derived from your primary objectives of the visualization. Then you go to the visual form. So 50% of your visualization is about how it looks, the aesthetic appeal and the, the way it gets presented. Now, what are the characteristics of uh, visualization? Something that's very insightful. Uh, visualization is something that has to give insights. If there are no insights, then probably nobody will look at it. They'll just spend about one minute looking at it and say, oh, it's so beautiful, but then that's about it. They won't use it. It has to be interesting, right? It has to be captivating. So it's, it's a tough call that you need to take uh, whether you want to keep it insightful or you need to keep it captivating. So if you're actually designing something for, uh, let's say, forecasting uh, analysts from supply chain background, you really don't want to keep it captivating. You have to keep it insightful. So that's something that, that's a balance that we need to draw. We'll see how we do that as well. And it needs to be intuitive. So the story actually comes from the intuition. So you actually define your storyline and then when you, you then, you, you actually design it that way, where it is intuitive, it actually, um, um, you know, kind of supports the user, assists the user in moving from one area to the other when he's actually exploring your visualization. Then it has to be interactive. Interactivity is another key characteristics of the visualization. Now quickly, a successful visualization, if you see, is actually something that is a combination of all these four. So if I just were to go and look at this, uh, if my visualization had data, okay, and it had a goal, I will end up with simple plots. I'm not sure if this is visible. It says plots here, and then it says visualization here. So if you carefully look at this particular slide, it actually sums up what the visualize, any visualization needs to achieve. And for us to actually do a successful visualization, what are the ingredients that is required? Now, uh, ingredients reminds me of food, and food reminds me of recipe. Uh, we have, uh, my colleague Balakrishna is going to talk about uh, the design principles of uh, uh, data visualization. So that session is happening at five. So people who find this interesting can go and take a look there. So that's more about the process and the key design principles that you need to uh, you know, keep in mind while designing a visualization. Now, I'm going to go uh, to um, common issues. So we looked at what visualization is. Um, I hope you all have, uh, or you are on the same page as me, where, where I say that visualization is 
the output of, let's say, a, a business insight is an output of advanced data analytics, uh, a dashboard, or a geospatial requirement where you're trying to show multiple insights in a metaphor or, uh, you know, a, a complex set of information, you're trying to display that. So assuming we are all there, uh, what are the common issues? So as a business user, you look at uh, a visualization, okay? Uh, you're not connected to it, so you haven't designed it. You're just looking at it, and then uh, what, what would come to your uh, mind? Uh, you see something that's too complex, and that's, it's got a lot of information, and you wouldn't know how to use it, right? Uh, if the visualization is not designed intelligently, uh, these are some of the issues. Sometimes we end up putting too much text, right? You look at infographies. Uh, infographies, I would say, sometimes end up confusing the most because that has content and it also has numbers. You just play around with numbers, it's easy to interpret. Or you just play around with content, it's still easier. But the moment you mix both, it becomes uh, too tough to comprehend. Clutter. Many times we want to put a lot of information, a lot of uh, visual encoding of information, and we want to keep things, we want to add, uh, you know, things here and there and things like that, that, that actually ends up making things more uh, cluttered. And hence, your, your original objective of the visualization, which has to provide insight, is somewhere lost in between. Sometimes it gets too overwhelming. You look at some representations and you feel that, how am I ever going to use this? Or how is it, uh, how is it going to help me? Okay. Then too many colors. So color is a very, very important pre-processing insight in visualization. Uh, if we don't understand the strengths of colors when we are representing insights, it ends up creating more confusion. So we need to keep in mind how to intelligently use colors. We'll see an example. We have a small exercise. We can do that. And it's not intuitive. So when you don't follow the storyline approach, when you don't start from uh, okay, I start here, I'm going to show these, these are my overviews that I want to show, and then when the user interacts with the visualization, he gets to go in a little deeper, he gets to dig a little deeper, and then these are the um, supportive evidences for the data that I'm showing, this is how I want to represent that. If you don't have that intuitive approach, it might appear not connected, there might be a lot of information disconnected, and the user will not be able to correlate. Some of the visualizations are misleading. We'll also see there is an example on how a visualization can actually be misleading. So far, so good. I can proceed. Okay. So we now looked at uh, what are the common issues or what are the common things that, uh, you know, as users tend to feel when they look at visualization. So those are the general terms that we have observed, and we've also uh, actually gained those terms from people who have looked at some of the visualizations we have created. So it's like, okay, so we need to be, we, we should not be, uh, you know, uh, too over enthusiastic in putting in colors and putting in too much information and things like that. So keeping that as a base, uh, we're going to look at how do we ensure that we keep two aspects of the visualization design in mind when we are designing it. Uh, one is visual integrity. Visual integrity is how truthful you are when you are designing because you're dealing with data, you're dealing with information. People are going to take decisions based on what you show. And when they actually get to drill down one level below, you need to make sure that the information is right. You cannot have um, wrong information popping out or you cannot, you cannot have wrong accesses there. We'll see how that can mislead an, uh, a visualization. And pre-processing. So pre-processing, what are the pre-processing insights? What are the small nitty-gritties that we need to keep in mind? We'll, we'll try and touch upon that as well. I haven't gone into details for any of that, but feel free to connect with me after the presentation. We'll be more than happy to give, me the, give you guys a longer version of my presentation. So when we go to um, visual integrity, um, there is a concept called uh, area-based uh, encoding. Uh, how many of you have got a chance to see this uh, infography? Infography that was published by Bloomberg some time ago. 
they, what they did was, they actually did a research on uh, the baby boomers. Uh, baby boomers are people who are born after uh, the World War II. And they said that um, uh, we will go to office environments, we will go and actually, um, uh, you know, speak to them and identify what they think of themselves, right? And then they said that they, and then they represented it this way. Now, in a visualization scenario, when you're trying to show insights, um, you can use area-based encoding, but the interpretation of this is always a composition. So you're always showing a bottle full of water. So it's zero to 100 percent, right? So that makes it, that would have actually made this, or uh, the interpreting this very clear. If you actually count this, this is 243 percent, right? This is not the right way to represent that. They should have made it so my entire bucket of people as 100%. That is the total count of people uh, who are baby boomers become 100%. So many percent of them think of themselves as creative. So many percent of them think themselves as people saving. So many uh, think of them as tech saving. Now, when you're designing this, how have how will you represent a person who thinks I'm a leader and I'm also tech saving? Where's your A union B in that case, right? Where, where is it, how are you going to show that um, multi uh, combinations, not just two, you want to show more, how would you show? How are you showing uh, a person, uh, so which is the largest um, set of people? So the maximum number of people from here, are, it appears as it's, as if it's people savvy, but when you actually do it in a 100% uh, scale, you will know it more, it will be more prominent. So the ideal way of representing this would have been a bar graph, uh, but a bar graph can be as creative as it can get. Bar graph is, is just the concept that you might want to use it here. So these are called isotype visualization. So if you really want to use an icon-based representation, an ideal way of it would be to use size and associate count to a size. So if you see here, you can actually associate, these could be your icons, and each icon could actually represent a set of, um, a number of people, for instance, and then you could make that more interpretive. So the moment a person would look at the visualization, he would know who's, what is the largest percentage of people thinking of themselves as a with a particular characteristics, right? So this is called area-based encoding, which is a concept, and it falls under data composition, if you want to get down to what actually it means in uh, the visualization scenario. Now the second example is, um, this is a creative bar graph. This is another infography. I will just, I'll just take 30 seconds. Can anyone tell me what could have been done better here? No, you need to have data points for that to do it. Definitely, he could have done it. Um, yes? Why not keep it in an ascending order so it's easier to the, the, the shape the shape can be improved. Yes, yes. So yeah? Uh, there are no memories, there are not attached. Like how can you compare exactly the exactly to the next area? And it's not even complete in a full space. Yes. So there is no scale of comparison. So if you see, um, while all of you have are right in you know the aspects of you can't read it has to be in an ascending uh, format and uh, the scale is not there the scale is takes a larger chunk of uh, problem area here so if you look at this um, see this is 957 deaths of truck drivers if you guys can read it 
and this is 292. 292 is one third of 900 and it appears uh, the information here is actually wrong. You feel you, you either associate this truck driver with the farmers or you associate the farmers with the truck drivers. But the gap is actually really huge, right? And the scale, scale is a very, very important uh, aspect when you are actually displaying information as uh, in a visual form because that actually creates uh, a positive insight or it could also lead to a misleading insight, right? So one way of representing whenever you're doing a bar, whenever you're doing data comparison on a scale, always remember that you have to follow this rule. That is, you have to ensure that the scale mapping is done. So you are directly representing it using a graph. You're using uh, implementation that's going to take care of it. But when you're trying to do it in an infography, you need to keep in mind that one third, you divide your overall, your maximum, and then you equalize the representations and then present it in the right way. Right? Now we'll go to um, a case study. This is also um, uh, based on economies of scale. Right? So um, why this case study? This is like uh, when we actually start designing and when we start uh, thinking of what to design and how to design, what we needs to go in, we need to start probing. So I'm sure we all do that when we design our uh, user experience and when we, when we are designing our products. We talk to our consumers, we do all the pro probing and prodding. But when you're doing data visualization, the probing and the prodding has to be done with data. You need to ask questions. You need to um, bring out evidences you need to bring out justifications of why you are actually representing information the way it is. So once you understand the underlying way you need to represent your information, you can actually go and play around with creativity and you can come up with, there are millions of ways to show data comparison. The, the concept of it being bar graph, but you can do a, a bar graph in multiple different ways. You can do data comparison in millions of ways, in creative ways, right? Now this was a uh, this was published again by uh, Bloomberg. So what they said was that uh, between 1972 and uh, 2012, the average salary of men in the US dropped down. And this is the graph that they have published. So what they did? Okay. So what they did was um, they categorized it by uh, three different, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, classif <laughs> classification of men, okay. So there's this person called Eric Portlands. He's actually uh, a data scientist. So what he did was, uh, when he saw this uh, data, he thought that, okay, let me li li dig a little deeper. This doesn't seem right, right? So what he did, he actually went and said that, okay, let me first add the scale. So they have 1972 and then 2012. Has the data actually, the, the graph has gone down, or let me add it for each year and see how it actually comes out. So when he found out that they, there have been some increases, there have been some decreases, and it's, it's not a direct, uh, you know, it has not come down in uh, directly. So then what he said, okay, uh, if you observe, there is no scale. It's actually starting from 32,000. So we don't know whether it's actually a drop from here or it's actually gone up from here, right? So what he did, he added a zero. He said, always remember when you're doing a truncated axis, it has to be justified. And it's not recommended that you start somewhere in the middle to show something because that leads to a misleading uh, information, which will actually end up giving the wrong insight to the user. So then when he did this, he saw that actually nothing has happened. So these guys have been getting uh, what they have been, uh, you know, uh, it is not a drop or uh, it has not gone up from anywhere and it's, it's a standard uh, pattern and uh, then he added the 19 I mean he, he decided to see whether it is going up or down so he added the number of years so just post World War II. So his observation is that the salaries have been increasing steadily over a period of years and then after that it's been stagnating it's not come down in relation to the inflation and in relation to uh, the kind of uh, uh, opportunities that have been there. So he actually questioned the uh, publication which said that 
the salaries of men uh, post between 1972 and 2012 have been drastically reduced. That particular statement is actually untrue. And then he, he actually proved it with that. So when we, are, when we, when we get into visualization projects, uh, what we need to do is we need to start probing. We need to act like scientists. We need to uh, start looking for evidences and see to support your theory or support your uh, opinion. Now, um, the second one is pre-processing attributes. Uh, this is where you actually look at, uh, uh, you look at uh, things like um, uh, color, you look at uh, things like shape, you look at things like uh, position. So uh, visualization is um, nothing but, uh, you know, the language of the eye and language of the mind. So uh, your eye is very visual. It looks at shapes, it looks at colors, it looks at positions and your mind looks at content. So when you're trying to merge both, you're actually having a whole gamut of, uh, you know, uh, methods using which you can actually present complex information fairly simply, right? Uh, contextual awareness. So I'm in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly uh, skip, I mean, talk about this, but not spend too much time on it. Uh, whenever you are working on any uh, visualization project, it's very important to bring in the contextual awareness. So if you see here, the, uh, this is again uh, publishing, uh, this was a visualization that was done by David McCandles, where he actually analyzed the uh, military spends of different countries. Now if you look at this, um, USA seems to be actually spending a lot in comparison to the others. Now you go and present this graph, it'll look like uh, uh, the U.S. is actually uh, spending too much on their defense and, you know, might send wrong signals, right? But what he actually did was, he brought it to the context. So he said, okay, my GDP is this much and I'm spending this much. So when you go and actually see how much U.S. spends, it's actually 4% of what it is, what the GDP of that country is, so which is fairly okay. So when you're representing information, bring that contextual awareness into the visualization itself so that wrong information is not uh, getting passed on and wrong interpretation does not, it doesn't result in wrong interpretation, right? Um, so what happens if you do not uh, follow the key principles? I have just two more slides. So um, this is a small exercise. Um, I'll tell you where I picked this from, but uh, I need more participation on this. If you guys can tell me what's wrong here or what could have been done better. of time I'm just quickly going to go and speak about uh, the answer I mean the my observations as well feel free to add more so one is as uh, you said uh, the Euler versus uh, the Venn diagram so as designers we need to know when to represent what um, and not end up in these kind of uh, uh, wrongful representations secondly it also makes you uh, connect so when I did this exercise at my workplace uh, we all mentally connected the red to all the reds. So which actually led us to wonder 
uh, Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra and Rajasthan, people between 15 to 34 die all the time. You're 35 plus, you're safe, you're not going to die. And similarly, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, poor guys, the oldies are gone and it's the young crowd that's there. Right? So they have used color, you're mentally associating red and black. So a lot of you said reds and blacks and am I associating that and you also said that red is giving a different uh, uh, neutral and a negative uh, view. The whole, the whole graph is negative actually, it's showing uh, the death toll or due to accidents. Right? Now that, that's the second one, right? Sorry, um, the next one is you're actually talking about major causes of death, right? So when you say speeding is actually occupying uh, the maximum, so it's around 60,000 deaths have happened due to speeding. You might want the user to actually take notice of that because that's something that's under your control, right? You, you can generate a positive thought that, okay, don't speed. So you want to do that, you, want, you probably have to do it in increase your space, show more importance to speeding or use intensity to show the uh, you know, maximum deaths occurring through what type of death. Then you have overloading. Uh, the second one is overloading. Third is hit and run. And drunken driving is a measly 7,000. But they've given equal importance to all. And this is another, this is again leading to a wrong interpretation of uh, information. And the third one, as I said, is the red uh, correlation. Right? Uh, anything more? If we had had more time, we could have sat and done this. Yes? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. The reason why I said the alternate colors is he didn't correlate it with that, but the reason is that when we see forms uh, in Excel, we change the color alternate so that there is no confusion between two lines. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason visual ergonomics I'm applying. So that is the reason I think he did. Yes, Alex, okay. So this is this appeared in the Bimes of India front page about three weeks ago. <laughs> so we thought it's good, uh, I mean, a good example to be used here. So um, we've done, um, we've looked at different types of uh, best practices. We've looked at key things that we want to uh, keep in mind uh, when we are designing. Uh, this is a consolidation of general principles that we want to uh, keep in mind. As I said, uh, you will always be questioned between aesthetics and insights. So depending on the context, depending on who are you designing for, you might want to choose. Yeah. And misleading with proximity, uh, you, you may not want to show information together where uh, it's actually uh, giving the wrong impression of uh, things being together while they are not. Uh, do not repeat information. So you end up using colors and intensity to show the same thing or shape and position to show the same thing. No, the user is going to interpret one. You either show color, you, sh you show shape, it's, it's the same anyways, right? If you used area-based encoding, you cannot show negative values. So what we didn't talk about there when we did that 0 to 100% in area-based encoding is if nobody thinks I'm a learner, so it's minus, how will you show that information? You can't do that when you're using area-based encoding. Remove noise. As I said, remove clutter wherever possible. You can't really get away with some aspects of design, but try and remove as much clutter as possible. You can use typography to visually represent uh, size. So you can play around with fonts. You can make certain things more obvious, certain things less. Uh, and it, it, it gets interpreted as something that's not important or very important when you're looking at it. Keep the UI clean, as I said, remove the clutter. And uh, do not split information if they are correlated. So you have one information on slide one, and while the user is interacting, if he has to correlate with something that is there in the, uh, the first screen or the overview, ensure to repeat that if there is a correlation that's involved. So uh, that brings me to the end of this presentation. I don't think we have time for questions, but feel free to talk to me uh, later on. I'll be around tomorrow as well. Thank you.